Welcome to Behind the Music, the Houston Chamber Choir's weekly podcast. I'm Sinjin Flynn. This time, we're joined by a former member of the Houston Chamber Choir, also one of its composers and one of its conductors. We have the triple threat here with Dominic Diorio. Dominic, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Sinjin. It's my pleasure to be here today with you. And where are you? So I am here in Bloomington, Indiana, at my studio in the Jacobs School of Music, uh, which is, uh, you know, more or less abandoned at the moment, uh, the, the campus, but uh, some faculty are allowed into their studios to do research and creative activities. So I was here today uh, using the piano to compose a bit uh, before our interview. And there's also stronger Wi-Fi for the sake of our interview that I wanted to make sure we could uh, rely upon. And I assume that you and yours are all safe and well during the, uh, the COVID-19 lockdown? Yeah, we are. You know, it's been a crazy time for everyone, uh, but I've not, you know, I think one of the hardest things has been not being able to see family. Most of my family lives in New England uh, in the Northeast, and so we were supposed to visit them at a certain time, and, you know, we were just trying to, uh, to do our part to stay distanced and to uh, stay isolated so that we conquer the virus, you know, as soon as we can. So you have been teaching virtually, Yes. Uh, so a lot of us, you know, in mid-March, uh, myself included, went uh, from being in person to this emergency remote teaching uh, is a good way to think about it because the, what we had to do in March and April to like convert all of our classes to some kind of online experience, uh, yeah. of course, not ideal. But this summer I taught a course in music career development, uh, which was a fully online course. And it was great to prepare for that online course in the context of knowing what that modality would be and knowing that, oh yeah, the course content will be delivered and engaged with in this way. So it can be a sort of ideal experience. You know, I know many students are sort of worried about what the fall might be because there will be a mixture here at Indiana University, for instance, in hybrid face-to-face uh, -face and online, at least currently as things stand, knowing that everything right. has changed. Uh, but it's going to be a different experience for students because we will have had the chance to prepare courses with this in mind, instead of mm -hmm. having to sort of on a dime switch and sort of convert everything that was supposed to be in person to something else. Uh, so there will be a definitely more robust online experience, I think, for our students. Well, when you're teaching virtually, uh, have you noticed that you have to teach in a different way? Yeah, I mean, I think about uh, boredom, right? I think about what it takes to keep someone's attention. And you know, this is the goal of a really good conductor in programming a concert or a really good composer in writing a piece of music, right? We deal in attention. We deal in keeping someone with us for a certain period of time and teaching is right. the same thing. Right? In a virtual environment, though, you have so much more at your disposal and so many more areas where it can go wrong, right? Uh, because it's very easy to disengage with the screen, right? It's not quite the same thing as having someone there in front of you. Uh, and of course, in Zoom, when we have, you know, the Hollywood squares type thing of nine of us here on a screen together, you know, someone might be paying attention to the top left square and ignoring the other seven. Uh, and so it's easy for you to maybe feel like you're both on screen uh, ends that you're not really being paid attention to. So I found in teaching an, an online course in this way, using uh, the Zoom platform and things, one has to sort of uh, always include, as in any classroom, right, a sort of dynamic interaction and engagement, right? Mm -hmm. So the student always feels like maybe they're watching a video for a little part, engaging in discussion, listening to something. So moving in and out of different kinds of engagement uh, leads to a more successful classroom experience. And I would say that's true both in person and online, but... Uh, right the sort of amplitude of those curves of boredom and engagement is a little more severe in the online format. Let's talk about your time in Houston. Hmm. You were here for a, a couple of years um, mm -hmm. and you sang with the chamber choir. How did that come about? Yeah, so I, I was in Houston for three years and they were three fantastic years, right? 2009 to 2012. Uh, and I came to Houston because I was teaching full-time at Lone Star College in um, Conroe, in uh, Lone Star College Montgomery campus. Uh, and I decided that when I moved to Houston, I wanted to live downtown, right? To be able to avail myself of the opportunities the city had to offer in terms of arts right. engagement. I wasn't quite as interested in living out in a suburb of, of the city. I wanted to be in the city. Uh, and I, I lived literally, you know, a mile from downtown, if that steps from the skyscrapers. Uh, and so when I first came to town, my predecessor at Lone Star, Gregory Risto, had sang in the Houston Chamber Choir uh, and had given a recommendation of me to Bob Simpson. Uh, and, 
and Bob graciously heard my audition and invited me to be a part of the chorus. And, you know, while there were so many fulfilling times, uh, things about my time in Houston, I would say that the chance to sing with, perform with, conduct, compose for the Houston Chamber Choir uh, was absolutely the best. Uh, and I still uh, think back to some of those concerts we gave as some of my most thrilling experiences uh, of my time in Texas. Had you sung in a, in a, a choir, an ensemble before? Oh, many times, yes, but not mm -hmm. a professional ensemble in the sense that uh, I was paid to be there, which is great. Uh, the right. closest thing to that was probably immediately previous to coming to Houston Chamber Choir, where I sang at Yale in the Scola Cantorum in Simon Carrington's last year there as its uh, director. And that was also a, a stunning experience. Uh, and But I would say that's the closest thing, right? In, in, uh, also, too, because they were both 24-person ensembles, more or less. And I think mm -hmm. the size of the Houston Chamber Choir has gone up and down over the years. I think when I was in there at one point, it was 24, then it was 26, and now I think it's closer to 20, right? And that's great to see an ensemble evolve like that and to see what can happen. But uh, before that, I had sung in larger choruses, right? But th that was perhaps the, the, the Yale School of Contorum and the Houston Chamber Choir were the first sort of uh, select uh, 24 voice ensembles, which many see as the, the sort of uh, right, whatever that means, right number for a professional chamber choir. And which section did you sing in? Not the bass section. <laughs> I am definitely <laughs> a tenor. Uh, and ever so often on occasion, I would veer into alto too, but I'm not really a counter tenor either. I, I'm more mm -hmm. that sort of French Baroque range, the au contre, right, where you have a sort of happy range from like uh, the a below middle C to the A above it, right? My voice lives in that. Uh, and I always had to be wary of this as a composer as well, because I would write parts that fit my voice <laughs> and maybe don't fit <laughs> the majority of voices. And so my baritone parts would always verge on the higher side. My bass parts would be a little bit higher than normal bass parts. And my tenor parts would just be tenor one parts. There, there's no tenor two in them, really. So I, I've learned that over time. You know, as a composer, we all develop. Uh, but that's... I, I'm a unique voice in that way, right? Not a large instrument, uh, but a flexible, high, light instrument, such that the, the top part of my range is, doesn't need to go into falsetto for a really long, long period of time uh, when it's trained and working well. <laughs> what did you learn through singing in the Houston Chamber Choir? Oh my gosh, uh, everything, <laughs> many things. Uh, I learned, well, first of all, I learned about some of the great people that are a part of the Houston Chamber Choir, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Kelly and Cami, for instance, who I know were on your program a few weeks ago, um, right. became just great friends. Uh, Michael Walsh as well, people like this that were, became a, a real part of like my life in beautiful ways. Kelly sang at my wedding. Uh, oh, really? Ago now, right? So just having people like that, I think, is is uh, something that we can't forget, right? Because choruses both exist in communities and are themselves a microcosm of community. Uh, mm -hmm. And even professional ensembles, right, which are ostensibly there because we're paying people to be there, right? Because they're living artists who are uh, committed to um, having a professional engagement with music does not mean that they're not also interested in the community aspect of music making. Uh, and this is probably true in instrumental ensembles too, to some extent, but it's really true in choral ensembles where what you're offering to the to the experience, to the room is your body, your instrument, your voice, right? That's no small thing. And so I think uh, in terms of what I learned there, I, you know, Bob was so gracious to me. He gave me so many opportunities to lead rehearsals, to conduct performances, to write music for the group and have it premiered. Uh, and then after I left Houston, he took our, our commission, A Dome of Many Colored Glass, and he performed it at the National ACDA Conference, uh, which was an amazing sort of uh, launching point for my career as a composer in many ways. Uh, so I think I learned to be uh, a humble <laughs> uh, achiever <laughs> in many ways, to take the opportunities given to me and receive them with grace and gratitude. Uh, and that's really informed uh, everything going forward for me in terms of my pedagogy, my artistry, uh, my engagement with my students, the kinds of projects I want to take part in as an artist. Uh, the Houston Chamber Choir and Bob's work with them served as a model for what the best sort of professional experience could be. Where were you in, 
it, within your career when mm. you came to Houston? I, I believe that you were finishing up your, your doctorate. That's exactly right. I moved in July of 20, 2009, right? So I would have been mm -hmm. uh, 25 years old. <laughs> uh, and I, I was taking part in the Yale Doctor of Musical Arts program. And that program is a little bit um, unique in its, at least at the time, in, in what we had to do. So all of my coursework was done and my paper was also done. Uh, but for the final steps of the doctorate from Yale, you have to put together a portfolio of professional accomplishment, right? Creative work, research, publications, uh, and then you have to apply back and you take a final oral examination, you give a final recital. Uh, and for a conducting uh, major as I was, that final recital is sort of dealt with a little differently because ordinarily doctoral students come back to New Haven, give their recital in the halls on Yale's campus, uh, and then have their exam the next day. It doesn't work that way for mm. conducting majors because we usually don't travel with our ensembles back to somewhere, right? There's a significant significant cost involved. Uh, right. So Maggie Brooks and Jeff Dalma uh, from uh, the conducting faculty at Yale came and heard a concert uh, with uh, my college group at Lone Star College as my DMA recital. Uh, oh, in wow. the, when was it? November or September of 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they traveled here to Houston. I got to host my faculty mentors, which was amazing and wonderful. Uh, and then I went back to New Haven a week or so after that to do the final examination. And that was thrilling, right? Because that's not usually what happens. And by the time I uh, knew I was getting the doctorate uh, after I had passed the exam, um, was also the time when I had applied to the Indiana University Jacobs School of Music uh, faculty opening. And I remember that I got confirmation of that job on my birthday in May 2012. Oh, really? Uh, yes. And so all of, and it was like four days until my commencement at Yale with a doctorate. So all of it, it was like a showering day of good feelings, you know, and it, it's nice when those come around because they don't come around too often. But when they do, it, it just felt like all of the wheels of fortune in the world were aligning that day. And it was a beautiful thing. So yeah, the, my time in Houston coincided with the, with the doctoral process uh, that, that led me to, to sort of take the next steps in my career afterward. And all the work I did with the Houston Chamber Choir became a part of that professional portfolio that I mm -hmm. used to apply back and attain the doctorate. So in many ways, it was, it was, it was like a, uh, I don't wanna say an internship experience, but it was certainly a pre-professional experience in the sense that everything I was doing was being used to substantiate my work as a creative artist and professional uh, for the awarding of my final degree. So your, um, your training primarily mm -hmm. was or is, has been as a choral conductor. Yes, uh, at least for my master's and doctoral degrees and a lot of my coursework as an undergraduate, but my bachelor's degree was in composition. Uh, okay. And I've also been playing piano since I was itty bitty uh, with my mother first teaching me and then other private teachers along the way. Um, but so, yeah, I wear these two hats as a creative artist, as a professional, right? One hat mm -hmm. is a composer hat, another hat right. is a conductor hat. Uh, and then both of those hats contribute to the sort of teaching sphere, right? Uh, which is a huge part of my life and what I love to do. Uh, and I like to think of myself as a musician or an artist who composes and conducts and teaches and performs and creates, rather than as a composer or as a conductor, right? Those are, of course, like uh, descriptors I apply to myself. But at the end of the day, there's not one hat which is more important than the other. They all right. sort of feed into the kind of creative life that I have chosen and love to lead. So do you see those two things as sort of hand in glove, being a, a conductor and a composer um, are two sides of the same coin, really? Yeah, I really do. And I see them as mutually reinforcing each other, right? Uh, so for instance, right, when I came back to Houston in September 2018, I was on sabbatical uh, from Indiana University and my project was to go and observe professional courses in the US. Uh, and I got to visit seven ensembles, including the Houston Chamber Choir, which of course I knew to some extent already, but I also really wanted to come back and see how the organization had evolved in the six years since I had left. And Bob had programmed one of my pieces on that concert. Um, uh, and 
he asked if I would conduct it. And I said, yes, I would be honored. To, like, I would be so ecstatic to conduct it. And so that's an example of how one hat sort of reinforces the other, right? There's this piece I've written that someone really likes. They say, oh, you'll be here anyway. Would you like to engage in conducting this work? Right? And so those two expertises feed off of one another. Um, or someone will have seen me conduct at a conference or something, go online to learn about me, listen to a piece, and then decide to program that work. Right? So the two, um, the two areas of activity are deeply intertwined. Uh, mm -hmm. And beyond that, you know, the expertises that lead one to be accomplished in one uh, feed into the other as well. Right? As I was saying earlier, if you can write a piece that's interesting, and keeps people's attention from the beginning to the end, then programming right. a concert is sort of like composing with other people's pieces, right? Composing <laughs> yes. activity out of the music of others to create a compelling arc, a compelling line that leads one from one experience to the next. You know, music, theater, uh, these kinds of things are interesting art forms because I like to think of them as captive art forms, right? We as the artists hold you for a period of time and say, experience this with us. Right. Whereas it's not quite the same in something like visual art. If you go to a museum, you can choose how to engage with, for instance, the canvas you're going to see and for how long. Now, the artist uh, that maybe painted that canvas had some ideas of what they want you to do. And so they may paint that canvas in a certain way so your eye travels from one thing to another, notices something else. I think of uh, Bruegel's painting about uh, Icarus flying too close to the sun, right? Uh -huh. uh, and it's just, it looks like a beautiful landscape. And then you realize there's a, you know, a fairy child just drowning there <laughs> and the farmers around are blissfully unaware of the scene, right? And if you don't take time to really engage with the painting, you might miss that detail, which in gives right. it an entirely different kind of commentary, right? Uh, music and theater, performing arts like this, engage the listener in a very different way, saying, you start with us and we hope you're gonna end with us too. And trust us to take you through that experience in a way that honors the time you're committing, right? Uh, and that's, I think of that as very sacred trust and responsibility as an artist, uh, because I am easily bored by other people's things. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want people to feel that way about what I do. Do you like conducting your own compositions? Yes. I do. I mean, this is one of the things about being a composer is that we write the music that we haven't heard yet, that, mm -hmm. that the world has not heard to some extent, and the music we want to hear, right? I, I write the music that, you know, I think uh, is uh, exemplar of who I am and who I want to be. And right. after we get past that stage, and then you say, well, if you as the composer would like to engage with people in bringing that music to life, uh, my, my answer to that would be yes, I would love to do that. Uh, because that's that collaborative experience of bringing art into being uh, is one of the most joyous creative experiences one can have. Mm -hmm. uh, and to have some handle in the initial recipe, if you will, and then to move to from recipe to dinner <laughs> uh, and to have part in that whole process is, uh, it's just a beautiful, um, experience. What about hearing or being present when somebody else is conducting one of your compositions? Mm. Is, that a, is that a painful experience or is it a, a, a revelation? Do you, have you heard conductors bring out elements of your work that you didn't know were there? Yeah, and that is one of the most exciting things about being a composer, because it really is a recipe, right? The score, people are, will interpret it in different ways. And mm -hmm. I, as a composer, have little desire in micromanaging that process, right? Or controlling it. I like to see what other people will do with the recipe I've provided. Um, occasionally, it will be painful because someone will just <laughs> you know, read the recipe and substitute sugar for salt or something, you know? <laughs> uh, but most of the time, most conductors I've worked with honor the nature of the recipe and just rebalance things a little bit that matches with their personal interests in a way that doesn't just change the recipe altogether, right? Uh, and I know I'm beating this analogy to death here, but I, I find it's easy to engage with and people can understand it in that way, right? I've had many chilies, for instance, in my life, I, you come to Texas, you could try 400 different chilies, one at every restaurant. And right. if I have a 
popular piece that people have done. You know, one person's tempo might be a little faster, another person's pianissimo might be ever so amazingly soft. And I love seeing uh, what people do with my music in that way. And I find that rarely have they butchered it to the point of destroying its, its uh, sort of essence or message. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, you did write a piece for the chamber choir, A yeah. Dome of Many Colored Glass. That's a wonderful title. Thank you. It's not mine. <laughs> or at least the words. <laughs> no. the words came from poet Amy Lowell. She's an imagist poet from the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and, and the four poems I said in the work uh, are all, um, I would say, you know, evocative, immediate, colorful things that I wanted to portray. And each of them sort of a little bit touches on a season. And so there's a sort of vague seasonal imagery between the four movements, although, you know, they're it's not uh, too explicit uh, to some extent. Uh, in others it is, like the last movement is called the winter ride, right? Or a winter's ride, I can't remember. Uh, and that's pretty clearly about one thing. But then there are other ones that sort of hint about summer, or hint about autumn. Um, mm -hmm. And I liked that. I liked that there were these uh, amazing phrases that one could set to music. Um, like the, the first movement, listening ends with the phrase a thousand cadences, right? And, and I think what I did for that was, you know, uh, I built this chord over the, the course of the piece that I just kept adding a higher note to. And so by the end, I think the top soprano, which was probably Kelly, I can't remember, uh, is singing a C sharp above the staff on and so it's something like that. And of course, you know, as a choral conductor that all the other voices a little lower in their range are gonna be responsible for the actual text. And the soprano right. up there is just doing everything they can to keep that C sharp beautifully in tune and beautifully balanced with the rest of the ensemble. So uh, yeah, I, I love that work. I would say it's, it was one of the first works I wrote where I knew that um, I could use all the crayons in the crayon box. Uh, <laughs> Right. I knew that I had a professional ensemble of such exquisite caliber that I could allow myself to dream without borders in many ways, uh, compositionally. And this uh, was thrilling. Now, some things, I, 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 I have, you know, my own internal boundaries of things I'm not going to ask singers to do because I don't think it's fair, <laughs> right? Okay. To have them, for instance, sing high right. in their register really softly for 10 minutes is not something anyone wants to do and something very few people want to listen to. Uh, so I, I, there were my own internal limits. So when I say without borders, I'm not saying that I'm going to, you know, ask them to stand on their head and sing <laughs> in septuplets or something like that. Uh, I think the demands I asked for were reasonable and were connected to the text and its expression. Um, right. But I wasn't worried about uh, about the things that you might be worried with, with perhaps, for instance, a high school choir or a non audition right. ensemble. I knew that I had 24 professional singers at, at my disposal and, uh, you know, uh, a conductor and interpreter in Bob Simpson who would honor the notes on the page in every way. Uh, and that was thrilling. So you wrote the piece mm -hmm. and were you part of the choir when it was performed? Yes. And yes. It, yeah, there was sort of a, a nice journey. I think the first year in the 2010-2011 year, we did one of the movements, the third one, Ora Stellatrix, uh, Hour of the Stars. And we did that during the Hear the Future event um, in, um, gosh, what is the church? St. John the Baptist? I don't even remember now what it's called. Terrible me. <laughs> this is how you know I've been in Houston for eight years. Uh, but uh, the we did that one movement in my second season with the Houston Chamber Choir. And in my third season, we programmed the entire work. And we did it in Houston. And we also took it on tour to Yale and to Trinity Wall Street. Uh, and Bob gave me the opportunity graciously to conduct some of the movements on tour as well, which was just thrilling. Uh, and then in it must have been June of 2014, he uh, was creating an album, um, which was uh, titled Soft Blink of Amber Light, which included a commission by Jocelyn Hagen uh, and included a number of the commissions by uh, the Houston Chamber Choir, including the Blue Estuaries, uh, David Ashley White, and Christopher Theophanides had a work on there, I believe. Um, and all of this was just amazing because he wanted to include my work with marimba on it too. And he invited his brother, Scott, to come and play the marimba part. 
uh, which was also just thrilling. So the entire arc of the piece with the ensemble was about four years long. Uh, and that's an amazing testament to the commitment Bob had made to the commission, right, over time in, in not just saying we're going to perform it once and be done, but to sort of uh, open up the process so that we can engage with one movement, then the whole work, then on tour, and then in recording. Uh, and that, I think, is testament to just who he is in the heart of his work also, right? Uh, these, these commissions are not done lightly. And the Houston Chamber Choir has been, you know, has commissioned a lot of composers, uh, but uh, each one has been treated with utmost care. And I, I put myself happily in that uh, phalanx of artists. <laughs> Let's talk about your um, early life. Um, did you grow up in a, in a musical home? Yeah, I would say absolutely. Um, and I'll qualify that by saying none of my immediate family uh, were professional musicians, uh, mm -hmm. but it was absolutely a musical home and a musical family. All of us uh, were taught piano by my mother at an early age. Uh, all of us took part in either chorus or band in middle and high school. Um, my father, while I was growing up, was learning to play guitar because he didn't have a musical upbringing but wanted to engage with music with us. Uh, and my mother's side of the family has a lot of people who, uh, even if they don't perform professionally, uh, make music all of the time, right? Like my uncle and my aunt who both uh, have a huge folk music sort of connection. So I was surrounded by music uh, in my life, I think. Uh, and then, uh, but I didn't understand really what professional, what the, the, the sort of music culture beyond school was. I don't think I really understood much about the music profession. We didn't really go to see the orchestra, for instance. That was not a part of my upbringing. So the sort of windows into the legitimate musical organizations and art forms, the opera, the symphony, chamber music society, none of that was part of my upbringing, uh, which I'm grateful for now because I could choose to engage with that as I went through my schooling to sort of understand a bit, oh yeah, okay, this is how these organizations work. And it also mm -hmm. didn't give me sort of preconceived notions about the barriers that these institutions sort of create for whose music is more important than others. Um, right. And that's, and I think that's been a nice frame to have because now I can look at those barriers when they exist and think, well, that's, you know, why do we give more money to this institution than, than to that one? Or why, why was it a big deal, right? When Kendrick Lamar won the Pulitzer Prize in 2018, for instance, you know, why is that something that, you know, caused a lot of people trepidation and a lot of others, you know, joy? Right. Right. Uh, think about these these institutions and the barriers we create and about which music is better or more important or legitimized above others. Uh, I didn't have those frameworks, right? Uh, and I learned, I think I, I started to develop them in school and then I started to dismantle them after that, which was refreshing. Um, but as one, as one looks at uh, the world today, you know, and looks at, you know, we mentioned one pandemic of the coronavirus, but the second pandemic of systemic racism, uh, and seeing how the arts community is responding to that now, I am, uh, I am hopeful that we're entering a time where the preconceived notions about which music belongs and which music doesn't uh, mm -hmm. are falling away. And I see that as a, an amazing and wonderful development for the field. Um, and for classical music in particular, right? Uh, to, to maybe just think of music as music and not necessarily to segment it uh, into sort of genres and things that have different levels of worth and value. I see that as a promising, hopeful uh, vision into the future about where music is going. What was the music that you listened to as you were growing up? Billy Joel, Elton John, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. my father's preferences. It was not by and large the pop culture of my generation. I tended mm -hmm. to just not be as interested in that. And then once I discovered classical music, I spent a lot of time listening to, um, you know, the composers we're supposed to listen to, <laughs> Beethoven and Mozart. And I had- The dead course, white guys. Yeah, lots of them. Uh, and, yeah. and also the ones who were recently dead, like Bernstein, right? Uh, or Copeland, that I found a lot of connection to uh, their music. Uh, and then gradually, as I became involved in choral music, I got to know a much larger, uh, swath of of Americana, if you will, that maybe is not just represented by Bernstein and Copeland, but you know, mm -hmm. folk songs, uh, African American spirituals, 
Uh, and this, I, I owe a deep debt to my teacher, Janet Galvan from Ithaca College, who I think opened my world uh, to, to choral music in a vibrant way. Um, and I, you know, I just, growing up, it's interesting now because uh, as I told you perhaps before this program, you know, I don't really keep a listening list on my phone. I don't really listen right. to music uh, as, a, as, a, as a soundtrack to my life. Mm -hmm. I tend to engage with music as an artistic uh, practice uh, and rarely do I find myself uh, preferring recorded sound in addition to some other activity. Um, usually I prefer silence <laughs> while I'm doing other things. Uh, and if I engage with something as a listener, I want to be able to commit to it as a listener. Uh, and so I'm not the kind of person that sort of puts in earbuds while I'm at the gym and then listens, you know, to 60 minutes of music. Um, I want to be mm -hmm. able to connect to the, the sounds being created and to really consider them, uh, which is, uh, you know, not how pop music usually works, for instance, you know, oftentimes right. you engage with at a peripheral level um, or you engage with as part of another activity. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I've, you know, I've, lived on that spectrum of engagement with it and not over the course of my life, times when I've been more engaged or less engaged. But uh, it's interesting t for me because when I met my husband, my now husband, right? Um, when he wasn't my husband when I met him, of course. But when I met him, <laughs> I think, uh, right? I know, I'm speaking myself into circles here. But when I, the, what, I, what I've said before to people is that the process of getting to know him, the beginnings of our relationship, was also for me uh, the beginnings of getting to know the wealth of repertoire from the jazz tradition. And so, really? yeah, and, and so getting to know the music of uh, Cole Porter, sung by Ella Fitzgerald, right, was a revelation because right. this was music that just wasn't a part of my life before I met him. And now I think listening to Tony Bennett, for instance, or Frank Sinatra, or Ella Fitzgerald, or June Christie, right, this is just now something that is a part of our life. Uh, and so that was wonderful to me because in meeting him, it wasn't just about getting to know this great person. It was also about getting to know this amazing music that had never really been a part of my lived experience. Uh, and so for, you know, I think of jazz music now in a very different category uh, in terms of its impact on my life, even though I've never been a performer. Uh, I don't have the training really to be a jazz performer. I feel a deep engagement with the music and its messages. Um, because of that. And I, I'm glad in many ways that it wasn't a part of my life earlier, because it made the courtship, if you will, even that much more um, alluring. What's your husband's name? John. John. And is he a musician? Uh, yes. Uh, he he is. has two degrees in music education. He taught in the mm -hmm. public schools um, for about four years. Uh, and he, he uh, plays trumpet. Uh, and uh, has a deep love for jazz, as you maybe have already picked up. Um, and he engages with music now more on a peripheral level. He works um, in sort of arts administration uh, mm -hmm. and, and helping to make music happen, supporting artists. And, and I think he prefers that uh, as much as he loves to also perform and also loves to teach. Right. And, and I, I've always seen him as someone who likes to help make things happen likes to sort of lift up others through the work that he does. And that's mm -hmm. also been a very powerful model for me uh, to see someone who's the, just that giving and generous uh, to, to other artists. And it's, it's inspiring. At what point did you realize that music was going to be your, your life, your professional life? Mm. Gosh. I, I've been thinking about this a lot recently because I'm. I've been uh, over the last few weeks. I've been preparing a dossier for promotion to a full professor, and as part of that, you write a personal statement looking back over your work and what you've done. And I did this five or so years ago for tenure as well. So it's it's not a new process. I'm a little familiar with it, but I I went back to read the statement I made in 2015 mm -hmm. uh, before writing the statement I'm preparing now. And I realized in reading that statement back then, it was a lot about the what of what I was doing, right? The achievements, the accomplishments, uh, and not a lot about the why. <laughs> and mm -hmm. 
and this has been something I've been thinking a, a lot about, right? How did I get here? Why mm -hmm. am I in music? Why do I compose? Why am I not a lawyer or a doctor or something else, right? Uh, and I think in 2015, I don't think I had good answers to those questions. I don't think I was really asking those questions. I was just thinking, you know, the part of the, the tenure process is proving oneself and one's accomplishments to others through a process. And I was, I think I was sort of consumed with that process, that I was forgetting to step back and think about why I did these things. And now I, I feel like I have much better answers for the questions I wasn't asking then, uh, in the sense that I know that I want to make music now because it can change people's lives. Because mm -hmm. the music I make can have an impact on people. Mm -hmm. That music can, has the ability to lift up others and communities. It has the ability to make people feel things. I first got into music because uh, in, I should say, choir and band in high school, because I felt a connection to people, right? I felt a connection to others through music as, an, mm -hmm. uh, as a connector for social engagement, for cultural awareness. Uh, and then somehow mm -hmm. along the way of schooling and getting ready for the profession, I think I lost part of that original seed, the sort of genesis reason for beginning. And I started to think of, oh yeah, this is what the music field prizes in terms of awards or accomplishments, and I need to make sure I do this. And we feel these pressures in any field, but I think in music, they're even somehow more fine-tuned, right? You're not a real composer unless you've written a symphony, right? You're not a real composer unless you've written a string quartet. Poppycock, right? <laughs> That's not really true. There are lots of great composers that have never done those things. And right. yet, we don't necessarily call them composers, right? We sometimes, like I think of Moses Hogan, right? I probably the greatest um, composer of the, or and we'll call arranger of the African American spiritual uh, a generation ago. Um, mm -hmm. Sadly, left this world too soon. Uh, and we think about Bach, and Bach was really an arranger of Lutheran chorales, right? But no one calls him an arranger of folk tunes, right? They right. call him a composer. And yet, many people call Moses Hogan an arranger instead of a composer, even though his process working with folk material to make original things is in many ways it's the same process. The same thing as Bach. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I start to deeply question these categories who gets to belong and who doesn't. Uh, and, and I've been turning a lot of my creative energies and work now to, to thinking of the institutions that teach our composers and our conductors. And are we, are we propagating some of these tired notions of what, what good music or right music or real music is? Uh, and how can we make sure that new music is not, uh, is not music that meets a specific sort of nicheified archetype of what it should sound like, but is really just music written by people that are alive today? And right? how can we broaden these definitions? Um, I can't even remember what your original question was. I've gone down. <laughs> uh, but that's all to say that, you know, uh, I've been thinking a lot recently uh, over the last few years about why. Mm -hmm. I'm in music, how I can use my privilege and my achievement and my position to help open up music making uh, for others, uh, to make sure that it's as broadly defined and aware as possible so that we're not limiting ourselves. I think the question was, when did you realize that, that music was going to, which is, I mean, I think, you, I think you've answered the question beautifully. Um, who was it mm. that said, was it Duke Ellington who said, that there are essentially, there are two sorts of music. There's good music and bad music. Was it Ellington or was it Bernstein? I can't remember, no, but no. music is music. And I think you, what you say about the, the barriers, the, uh, the definitions that we put in place do it a disservice because, you know, as you say, Moses Hogan is uh, as great a, a composer as Bach in terms of, you know, yeah. actually doing the work and, you know, knowing how it's done and what have you. Um, Bach Moses has the Hogan. benefit of a, of a longer lived life, right? We don't know right. what Moses Hogan would have composed had he lived beyond the 46 years he was here with us. Right, right. right. I th we think this about Mozart too, right? He lived 35 years. What would Mozart have continued to write were he still alive? Right. Um, and Bach had the benefit of looking back at his life and thinking, here's what I've done. Now, I, how can I package 
uh, you know, the B minor mass? How can I take the work I've done to create these works that will stand with my legacy? Right? So many composers don't have the chance to do that. And we're lucky Bach did, because the B minor mass is an extraordinary, extraordinary work. Uh, and it, it'd be even fairer to say like con conglomeration of lots of other works, right? Because he's, he didn't steal, he borrowed from his other music to create this sort of final patchwork statement. Um, and it's incredible, uh, but, but most people don't have that option. Most people don't realize when they're going to go. I'm sure Bach didn't either, but he got to look back on his career and make some choices about the music he wanted to stand for him afterward. Um, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, and I, I sometimes wonder, like, what would Mozart have looked back on? What would he have burned <laughs> so that we never found it? And what would he <laughs> really, like, wanted us to remember him by? In terms of your own uh, composing life, mm -hmm. what are your goals? Are there things that, um, that you haven't done yet that, that you want to do? Is there a sort of composing bucket list for you? That's a great question. Um, probably somewhere. <laughs> I tend to think about my compositional activity as connected to particular people and particular projects. Mm -hmm. And so um, right now, for instance, I'm preparing a commission for an organization in DC um, uh, for children. And that's the one that's consuming my thoughts and mind and everything I'm about. And then after that, I'll be writing a song cycle for a dear friend uh, for, for her to premiere. And so that will then be <laughs> center and forefront in my mind. So each of my compositional projects has been about a particular set of variables and configurations and possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and more and more, they've been about uh, projects that I, I feel deeply connected to. Um, so for instance, I would say that, uh, which one do I choose? Um, hmm. I'll do this one. So in April, right, it was about four weeks into the pandemic and I had a deadline coming up for a new work for organ and chorus uh, to be premiered this coming October uh, to celebrate the, a new instrument that was being installed in this church. Mm -hmm. And I was really thrilled to accept the commission when I did, uh, and I was thrilled to deliver it when I did also, but the in-between was a little difficult. And it was difficult because in March and April, joy was one of the harder emotions to access in our world, right? And so mm -hmm. writing a piece that connected to a joyous experience, a joyous text, felt almost disingenuous at a time when we were in social isolation, right. disconnected from one another, in many cases in lockdown. And so for me, accessing joy, accessing the hope and optimism of a future where we could perform and feel safe again, where we could sing together and not feel like we might lead to someone's death. Right. That's, that was hard. <laughs> uh, and yet, I am a composer who has not missed a deadline and I pride myself on that. And I was not gonna miss a deadline this time either. And it happens that that piece and the two I had to compose immediately after it were all celebratory pieces, all joyous pieces. And so in many ways I had to find a way to access hope for the future. Normally, this is not a hard thing for me. Normally, bubbly, optimistic, bouncy, happy, that, that tends to be like where I live. It's much harder <laughs> right. to find like lament uh, for me as a composer anyway, as an artist. But, but joy was hard then. You know, I wanted to write music <laughs> that made people feel isolated and I couldn't do that for this piece. Will the piece be premiered in October of 2020? Probably not. He'll probably be premiered <laughs> a little later, but, uh, but I got it in on time, right? And that's part of my own professional responsibility. I don't like this sort of myth of the composer as someone who has to, you know, not be bound by deadlines or, or gives the piece to you two days before the performance because they just had to spend six more weeks agonizing over it. No, right? A composer is a craftsperson as well, and we, we can honor our own deadlines as we set them. And honestly, if you want a good premiere, you have to give them time to rehearse. <laughs> you have to give the conductor time to learn the score. Uh, and right. so it's not in your best interest to 
keep revising and making changes and not delivering the score until the last moment, as so many composers, it seems, the myth goes, do. So yeah, that's, I, I guess, in terms of a bucket list, I, I've been writing longer and longer pieces recently, a lot of 15 to 20 to 25 minute works. Uh, some of those are song cycles. Some of them are uh, chorus and large ensemble, whether it be wind ensemble or symphony. Uh, and I've been moving more and more in that direction in addition to the work of writing you know, a four to five minute choral work. Uh, and that's been really exciting. I've not yet written a concert length choral work. And that's definitely something I want to do. Uh, and I don't know what it will be or what its thematic content or what its message or why the world needs another one of those. I, I almost see it as a self-indulgent thing to be the one composer on the program, right? <laughs> it feels a little wrong somehow uh, to take the space of a concert all for yourself. Uh, wow. and, and I don't know how I feel about that, but at the same time, you know, some of the, the works that we study and talk about, the minor mass of Bach, right, is, is almost two evenings worth of music, so, uh, or the Christmas oratory of six nights, depending on how you want to do it, or right. maybe two or three, but um, yeah, I've, I'm, I think I want to move in that direction at some point, uh, but I've, I've enjoyed, you know, spending time getting there. I feel no urgency or rush to write a requiem, for instance, you know, that's not, I don't feel the clock ticking. Maybe I'm naive, <laughs> but um, it's not been something that's happened yet. And so it's not been something I've been preparing for. I want to go back to what you were talking about, the, the, the piece that you had to finish. Yeah. Um, writing a celebratory piece mm -hmm. during the pandemic. How did you access the joy that was necessary how did you come to to be able to 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 infuse the piece that you were writing with that emotion that was not the emotion that you were experiencing at the time yeah i think i had to just step back and look at my life and the things i was grateful for and find that joy again Right. Recognizing that no one in my family had died because of the virus or seeing that I, you know, even though I was locked in a home with my husband and two cats, I was able to be in a home right, right. with a loving husband and with two furry felines who keep us swiffing. <laughs> you know, there were lots of things I could be grateful for. And joy comes from that, I think. Um, and uh, even to be able to you know, there's something, I, I think for conductors especially, uh, there's this sense that you have to sort of control what's happening uh, in a performance um, rather than allow things to happen. And in the pandemic, uh, all of those sort of like veneer of control is gone. <laughs> no one knows, no one knew in mid-March how to, how to teach a chorus <laughs> through Zoom, right? None of us did. Right. So in many ways, yeah. the pressures of getting it excellent were removed, at least until this fall, and we'll have to do it much more better, than, much better than we did. Uh, but for a time, you know, there was a sense that we were all embarking on something new together, and that that was kind of exciting. At the same time, it was terrifying. Uh, and I'm also president of the National Collegiate Choral Organization, so I could also see that you know, we had an opportunity to provide resources for our collegiate choral conductor members. Um, and that was reassuring, right? There was a sense of responsibility that came with this, a sense of, again, helping others through a time, deciding on things together. And the more and more I, I sort of lived through March and April, I realized that I was doing a lot of work, a lot of work I wasn't expecting I would be doing, but it all felt very purposeful. Mm -hmm. It really made a difference. And that, I think joy comes from that too, that satisfaction of knowing that your work is needed, it, that, it, that it leads people to have better lives, that it helps people to process and deal with things. Um, that's, I think joy came from there too. It's not quite like, yahoo! <laughs> uh, but it's definitely, uh, definitely uh, an inner, inner centeredness, I think, that mm -hmm. uh, definitely has, um, led me to be able to 
move through these times, admittedly from a position of privilege, but also from a position of um, sort of quietude of, okay, this is happening around me and we will get through it. And I can do some specific measurable things to help us get through it. And maybe that's enough. The analogy I think about is, um, let's just say an old woman at her house who every day goes out in front of her home and tends to her garden, right? She may not be able to make everything in the world perfect, but she can make her small patch of world, right? As beautiful as possible. Uh, and I think there's great joy in that. We have a, a Bernstein element there, don't we? The, the end of Candide, mm -hmm. you know, making our gardens grow. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a big word Dominic. we won't be able to hear anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Look, thank you very much for taking this time to, uh, to talk to us. It's been fascinating to, uh, to hear you talk and to, to experience your, your love of music, your enthusiasm, but also your love of humanity, which is what underlies all of your music and all of the, the musical things that you do, because as you, as you seem to be saying, music is about community. Absolutely. And yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that, uh, that you've shared that with us and best wishes for the remainder of the, of the lockdown. I hope that, uh, that you can still find that joy as you're composing and uh, best wishes to to you and to john uh, and the cats thank you very much for <laughs> thank you very much dominic for being with us and thank you so much and i'll just leave with a small anecdote which was uh i was going to uh take my husband to houston march 14th right at the start of our spring break and that trip was we, we were asking ourselves on march 9th like should we still take this trip should we still go and a day later we were like nope we should not we should just postpone <laughs> this for a little bit and so i know both of us are really lo looking forward to getting back to houston uh when it's safe to do so uh, because i still want him to try you know tex-mex for real <laughs> thank you for having me here today it's been a pleasure well, and we look forward to seeing you in Houston. You know that there will be so many people that, uh, that will want to see you both when you're here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to talk to you today. And thank you to everybody who supports the Houston Chamber Choir, patrons and sponsors. And thank you to you for watching and listening. I'm Sinjin Flynn, and this is Behind the Music. Houston Chamber Choirs with One Accord is your one-stop shop to choral joy. Help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. Visit us at HoustonChamberChoir.org.